Thank you very much for coming in this beautiful uh, Friday afternoon. I'm su slightly surprised that the organizer and the chair didn't mention about the fire exit and uh, oh. where we should <laughs> go in the unlikely scenario that there's alarm, etc. Because whenever I go to any public event in UK, we're always reminded what they are going to do about the fire uh, safety. Uh, yes, dear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, thank you very much, actually, for not mentioning that earlier. Um, so, um, uh, no, I'm, I really feel honored and uh, pleased to have this opportunity just uh, to air out, actually, some thought in oh, my... So oh, yeah, sure. So, uh, I should so go I'm there, right? Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. So, so I'm very pleased uh, and honored uh, to have this opportunity to share with you some very tentative ideas in my mind, and these ideas actually are not very new, as I will tell you, that uh, these ideas came to me in the year of 1994. I mean, if I may say so, I'm not sure. Some of you were all born before, by, by that time. Uh, but somehow I feel it's, it's, it's this kind of idea uh, that shows their shape to me in a very vivid and strong way but I feel it's very difficult to capture it in words, huh, to articulate as a, as a, in theoretical language. So I always feel this have the kind of sentimental and, uh, 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 and affective uh, uh, affinity towards this, this idea. But at the same time, I'm also troubled by the vagueness uh, of this thought. So now, you know, after more than 20 years, I... Uh, so therefore, this is a kind of experiment, actually. I try to, to see whether or not I can give some shape to the kind of feelings that I have accumulated over the last 20 years, primarily based on my field of research on migrants. And as a part of this experiment, we organized a small workshop in Oxford in last September, uh, which Jiaxi and Kakin attended, so I invited them to come along today as well to uh, share with us their observations and the thought. So the title, I changed the title slightly uh, as compared to what was advertised uh, on the website. And now the title is uh, Suspension, just one word, Suspension, and uh, the subtitle is Entangled, in, uh, Entangled Developments and Hypermobility in China. So this is the Entangled Developments is one of the kind of sub secondary concept that I want to use to give shape to, to what the image that I have in my mind. Okay, I mean, the starting point is a kind of very straightforward empirical observation, namely the hypermobility among uh, Chinese working populations, especially rural urban uh, migrants. As I suppose many of you know, that uh, rural urban migrants, they move very frequently uh, both in terms of jobs as well as in terms of residence. You know, the statistical data shows that they change jobs every two years, and the younger the workers are, the more frequently they move. Migrants born after 1990, Baling Ho, change jobs every one and a half years compared to every 4.2 4 years among those who are born before 1980. Actually, interestingly, uh, women change jobs more frequently than men. So they change jobs every 1.6 years as compared to 2.3. And this hypermobility actually is not new. When we did the field research in 1994, as I mentioned earlier, in Dongguan, uh, Po River Delta, we actually observed this phenomenon already. According to our survey data, migrants at that time were already changing jobs uh, every two years. And uh, factories that we investigated at that time lose about, lost about 5% of their workforce every month. And uh, lots of factories imposed kind of various uh, measures in order to slow down the mobility. For example, they were charge bonds as well as they were withdraw, uh, withhold two months' salary during the first two years. 
which means if you uh, mo uh, quit your job within the first two years, you will lose a bond as well as you will lose a two months salary. Huh? But even this measure did not really uh, prevent the workers from changing jobs all the time. I mean, of course, this is you know, hypermobility in a way was against the workers' their own interest. When I talking to the management of the factory, you know, I ask them why you don't provide a better working and the living conditions for the migrant workers, and the management said, you know, why should we? They have no loyalty to factories, and they are going to move away in a few months, you know, probably uh, one and a half years. I mean, why should we provide a better documentary, uh, dormitory and the food or training, especially for the workers? Uh, so that is a starting point. Then we try to use the notion of a suspension to think through this behavior of hypermobility. Right? Hypermobility is something empirically, direct, immediately observable. But what is behind that? What is the consequences of that? What is the meaning, the feeling of moving so fast? We wanted to capture that kind of thing through the notion of a suspension. Uh, then suspension, the first of all, actually it indicates a structural condition. As we know, we have the hukou system in China, which prevents uh, rural residents from settling down in cities, except you, know, you meet some very uh, quite uh, 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 strict uh, requirements. So therefore, structurally, these workers, migrant workers, are put in a suspended status. Right? So you are in the cities, you can benefit from the urban economy uh, through uh, you know, work, and then you can make a savings and accumulate wealth, and etc. So economically, you can be well integrated. You are not necessarily excluded outright, but then you don't have the long prospect in the place there where you work. So therefore, it's put in a suspended status. It's not outright excluded structural condition. Secondly, a suspension actually means a voluntary uh, working life strategy on the individual level. So people often actually forego, why do I hear the uh, kind of background sound? Uh, so the people voluntarily forego settled lifestyles and they voluntarily choose to move frequently from one place to another. And then the re why do they do that? Uh, so a typical scenario is like this. They are away, from, I mean migrants are away from family, so therefore you know, they spend long hours working very hard in the factory, as long as possible, normally about at least 10 hours. When we did the survey, 10 hours a day. And actually often they demand uh, over hours in order to have a higher pay, so maximize the savings. And of course, at the same time, they minimize uh, their socialization. I mean, just uh, one anecdote. When I was doing the field research among uh, workers who migrated to Japan, Singapore, and South Korea, you know, they told me, actually, the salary was not necessarily so much higher overseas compared to big cities in China. But the main reason for them to go overseas is because they can earn dry money overseas. So what is a dry money? Because all the money you earned overseas will go to your account. Why? Because there's no socialization. Huh? So you will turn yourself into a kind of working machine. You know? So therefore suspend, suspend your normal life to maximize your savings. Huh? And then the condition become unendurable too much. What do they do? They jump ship. They move to the next job. I mean, I'll talk about, I mean, the primary uh, empirical basis of my paper is internal mi mi uh, migration in China. So they move on to the next job. And then they work very hard, endlessly maximizing savings uh, until the situation become quite, uh, again, you know, too boring, too, too, too too difficult, they move on. But the situ because by doing so, uh, the condition of the job never change. Huh? They just move from one bad job to another bad job. Hmm? 
But why do they do that? Because they think that is a faster way for them to accumulate savings, and then one day they can move away from this manual work altogether. They can change their social status, so they will no longer be a migrant workers. Hmm? So therefore, they always try to instrumentalize the present moment rather than problematize the present moment. They know. The present moment is deeply problematic. They are working on the living condition. It is by no means satisfactory. But they think it would be foolish if you spend the time try to change it. The best way you should do, the way that you deal with this situation is to make a good use of this working condition, save maximum, and one day hopefully you will move away altogether. Right? So this is a kind of a sense of it's instrumentalizing rather than problematizing the present. It's a, it's a sense of, of uh, suspension. So uh, certainly, I mean, suspension also means actually it's kind of uh, suspension, suspending your ethical uh, uh, judgment. Huh? That, I think, has been implied in the second dimension of suspension as a voluntary choice, because you, know, you, don't, you don't problematize the situation you are facing, right? You, 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 so therefore, you don't confront the problems. You don't take actions to change. Right? You just hope to make uh, the, uh, the most use of it and in order to run away. In order to run. So this is what I mean by uh, uh, suspension. And then there's, as I said, uh, which, uh, the, the problem that I have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the from which I have suffered from 20 years, is that this notion is so vague. Uh, it is a more uh, uh, evocative image, the notion of suspension. I suppose it is a more kind of evocative image rather than articulated or explicit concept. Right? So this is a difficult day, and then, but uh, we think probably. Um, uh, the reason that we want to uh, still do it, you know, to think through hypermobility through the notion of suspension, despite <coughs> the notion is so uh, vague, is that we want to kind of do an experiment of what we call phenomenological problematization. Phen phenomenological problematization meaning we problematize our living conditions through and from pre-conceptual experiences itself, rather than judging the conditions through established concept or against a given criteria. And why should, why we think that it is quite, I mean, we don't know whether or not it works, but we think it worth trying, at least for two reasons. Number one, we just feel these mainstream dominant languages that we have, such as social exclusion, uh, precarious labor, and the marginalization and the expulsion. This is South Carolina, probably not so mainstream, but it's quite a popular word as well. Really can't capture the condition uh, that we witness in China. Especially does not capture uh, the feeling, the feeling and uh, uh, the meaning uh, of this uh, struggle for the people who are inside of this uh, struggle. And the second reason that we think it uh, may worth trying is related to uh, the, the, the fact that the suspension may capture the feeling quite well, because I, it, it is that by being uh, experience near and uh, by being sensitive to actors' sentiments, we hope this uh, mode of analysis will have a strong resonation with the public, with the actors. Mm -hmm. So therefore, probably we can urge the public to rethink their lived experiences. And I think, you know, among the intellectual left, we have witnessed the shift of uh, this uh, critical attention from the level of a system to the level of a subjectivity. 
at least since the 1960s. And of course, Foucault made a major contribution, I suppose, in this shape. But we think, OK, the social change does not really come from systemic change, but probably ch the change will, uh, lies with the level of subjectivity. But this shift has been very productive and very useful, but somehow I feel it's quite ironic. With this shift, we also lost uh, the capacity of mobilization and the public engagement. We can say, you know, Marxist critique is very systemic. It's talking about the grand political economy, does not pay much attention to sexuality, gender, subjectivity, and etc. But the idea of having systematic, well, it's not, uh, yeah, systematic and the systemic uh, a critique is in order to enlighten, I mean, it's an old fashioned way, enlighten and educate and therefore mobilize the masses. But after, uh, I think especially after the 80s and the 1990s, and it's related to the post-Cold post -Cold War politics as well, the emphasis on subjectivity actually is becoming increasingly narrowly academic. Yeah, so subjectivity become a subject of analytic, I mean, academic analysis, rather than a vehicle for the academic to reach out to the public, right? So then subjectivity just become a subject study rather than a vehicle for mobilization. So we wanted to, you know, to see whether or not we, uh, uh, you know, through this uh, awkward idiom of uh, 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 phenomenological problematization, uh, we, we, we wonder whether or not uh, analysis of subjectivity can be combined with uh, that kind of outreach and the potential mobilization, a uh, kind of kind of wake up, uh, wake up. So I mean, the reason we're thinking that it may be worth doing this uh, is very much because um, uh, I gave some kind of interview in public media, and I was very surprised actually in China. You know, it somehow was very well received by the public. Oh, it's much popular than anything else I have written so far. And I said, OK, you know, all this academic analysis can be very interesting. But when academic can give an image, a tool to the public, and the public feel, uh, uh, they feel stirred, they're being stirred up, actually, then their mind start working. And they start asking questions to themselves. Probably that is something very powerful. Huh? But of course, the challenge is that how we can translate that language into rigorous and clear and systematic analysis. I don't know. But anyway, so that is uh, uh, um, uh, uh, so the basic spirit of this experiment. So I mean, today I'm just then probably, it depends how much time uh, we will have. I will just go through probably uh, uh, three uh, quick sub-themes. Number one is uh, give you a little more idea about what uh, suspension looks like based on my own past work. Number two is uh, the uh, political economy context uh, under which suspension takes place. Therefore, we will appreciate better uh, what suspension means on the uh, more macro level. And uh, thirdly is some kind of uh, key dynamics uh, around which or through which suspension is uh, constituted. Huh? Suspension is not just a, 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 a kind of a, a static status, right? It actually needs conscious human effort and of, often quite a painful effort uh, to sustain the state of suspension. So therefore, there's a very, some very concrete dynamics uh, at working. So first of all, you know, uh, uh, again, just the, the, uh, what the suspension looks like. I mean, suspension, yes, that the word, again, it's a difficulty uh, that we face. Uh, it is originally a translation of Chinese term, because when the image comes to me, it comes to me through Chinese language, right? It's a xuanfo. Xuanfo is, is a kind of hanging and floating, right? And uh, the immediate uh, uh, image that uh, uh, the Chinese audience will have after listening to Shanfo would be like uh, the suspended train. Huh? So it is uh, moving something very, moving very fast, but it is hanging in the air. 
uh, rather than you know we suspend our event, you know we we will hold, put on hold or, or postpone. I mean, has a, this connotation as well, but mainly it's a kind of suspension train. Huh? So that is uh, the image that we have. Um, so uh, then I have this uh, the hummingbird image. You know, this small small hummingbird. It, uh, they kind of they keep itself. Uh, still in air by vibrating their wings frantically, uh, very very fast. So, and they are not uh, moving, uh, not, not necessarily moving forward or backward. And they work very hard uh, just to uh, uh, hold itself up in the air. Uh. So that is is uh, the, the image that I have based on my observation of migrant workers. Um, so. Uh, so what what uh, suspension looks like, you know, in Paul River Delta twenty years ago, I observed uh, migrants moving so fast, and the one discovery that I had was that they are moving so frequently, not for better pay. I mean, uh, better pay is only a small reason for them to move so fast. Huh? We have a survey data; only twenty percent of migrants told us that they move so fast is because they found a job pays better. Most of them actually move so fast for social reasons, social reasons. And for female migrants, a very common reason for moving on, for quitting the job and moving to a new factory was a quarrel with dormitory mates. And for men, a common reason is a boredom. Just get bored, so I therefore move on. So therefore the question is, okay, if you have you know, you move on because they're bored, or why don't you organize something, you know, to entertain yourselves? And if you uh, have quarrels and the conflict with your dormitory mates and your, 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 your workmates in the, in the workshop, I mean, uh, floor shop, and why don't you uh, find a way to, to, to find a solution by you know, talking with the management or, or, or some kind of a coordination among yourselves? As I said, they just found that that would be a waste of time. The best, uh, the best thing to do is to, 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 to move on instead of, of, of changing reality. The changing reality is too complex, <laughs> it's too unpredictable. You know, the most important thing now is earn enough money, then you can move on. You can talk about other things later. Um, so then, I, when I was do, uh, working on the international outer migration from northeast China, and I was uh, surprised by how they suspend ethical uh, principles in their process of pre uh, preparing for moving overseas, especially when they dealt with uh, the commercial intermediaries. Uh, the in commercial intermediaries are often uh, quite unscrupulous, and uh, they took your money and uh, ran away. And uh, my assumption is that when that happened, of course, the victims, the neighbors, uh, will get together and uh, go to the office of the intermediaries, ask for uh, compensation. No. If you are a victim, if you are swindled off by a uh, commercial intermediaries, and your neighbors will laugh at you. And you had to hold your head low when you went out. I mean, it wasn't obvious who was a victim and who should be punished. And I asked the, the, the villagers, and all the villagers agree about the principle. But I just read the one shopkeeper, how he explained to me why they thought that people were laughed at as victims, but somehow think that the intermediaries uh, could get away with this. You have to admit that the intermediaries are capable people. 能力,有能力的人, capable, is actually a very important word in Chinese mentality now in order to justify many things. Capable people, everyone wants to make money quickly. So the who go overseas want to make quick money too, just like the intermediaries. So therefore, there's no big difference. You, know, you want to go overseas, also want to make uh, quick money. If you don't know how to handle the intermediaries, it's just that you lost out to them. Basically, you are less capable to them. So therefore, life is just a game. 
about to compete to see who have more capacities and who are more capable, right? You want to make quick money, so do the intermediaries. If now you are treated too bad, it just means you are not capable enough. Hmm? So that kind of, uh, everyone is rush uh, 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 to success, so therefore kind of suspend the ethical judgment and about what is right and what is wrong. Uh, so that is another dimension of suspension that I observe. I mean, the actually, so what really uh, uh, struck me about the, I mean, uh, make me think of suspension more seriously is a more recent encountering with two migrants. One is a lady of middle-aged woman in Shenyang, and she told me, you know, she's going to Italy working with domestic helpers for people coming from Wenzhou, huh? my, <laughs> my, my, my Tao man. I'm from Wenzhou originally. And she said you know, she's divorced. Oh, it's very painful, you know. I have to be away from my daughters. But I have to go because I earn money in order to earn money to pay my daughter's college education. And she said it's painful, but I just, just telling myself, I take it as if I went in. I don't know whether or not it makes sense to you, but at my, for people at my age, is still is a word that immediately makes sense to us. It means that you are in prison. You are arrested. You are arrested. Mm -hmm. right? They think, okay, I go overseas for three years, I just think I'm, I, I, I went in. This is such an active and, and, and uh, a painful act. So somehow feel, okay, how, how should I describe that suspension? If you suspend your life, right, as if you put yourself in prison in order to accumulate uh, uh, money to deal with some life uh, 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 challenges. And another, actually, male worker, I mean, another person who really uh, drove home the, the strong sense of suspension is a taxi driver in Guangdong, and he worked two shifts a day. You know, he's basically my age. I mean, I know how difficult it is uh, if you work very long hours at my age. And I said, don't you worry about your health? And he said, the health? Health is something for future to be worried about, to be worried about in future. Shenti, shenti, nashi yi hodish. Shenti is nashi yi hodish. Of course, he knew that the health is, is not something that you can worry about later. If you don't look after yourself well, you know, everything will be too late. Eh? But he chose to do that. He chose to do that. So it is a kind of a suspension. It's not only postponing. It is really cutting your life into different domains or different parts. So therefore, you put on hold some quite essential part of your life and hoping that one day you can regain it or, uh, or probably not hoping you will regain it just because you, 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 if you don't suspend, for example, your concern, your health, you will not be able to accumulate enough wealth to be part of the game. Right? You will be left behind, so everything will be too late. Right? So you will be no uh, a means to, 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 to worry in the, even in the future. So that's, uh, uh, so I mean, uh, so that is, is a kind of, you know, just uh, some um, uh, uh, vignette of what a suspension looks like. If you can help me to articulate better the definition, that would be very helpful. Then quickly, the context, the second uh, sub theme, the, the uh, political economy context of suspension um, is I, we call it uh, entangled developments, which again is not a very satisfactory term, but I haven't been able to think of a better one. By entangled developments, we mean rapid changes in various social domains that pull into different directions, both within and across the domains. Yet they are tightly entangled with one another and affect our life as a whole, and therefore must be understood in entirety. Okay, what do I mean? Is, I mean so the development, basically there's a development uh, uh, yeah, pull in different directions. So then uh, let me go through the developments in four domains, which are really 
uh, kind of uh, uh, illustrate the entangled development. Number one in economy, and this I think is quite a straightforward economy in China and across Asia is uh, 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 continue growing, but of course the inequality is uh, widening. So therefore, you you um, people are quite you know migrants actually. They are hopeful for that they will have a better future at least in the you know material terms. So that hopefulness, I think, is realistic. But this sense of hope is deeply intertwined with a sense of fear and anxiety, the fear of being left behind. This is in economy. Second domain is governance. Of course, we know that China, the Chinese government, and as well as many other governments in, I think, in East Asia, in some Southeast Asia as well, is known for the very strong capacity in both promoting economic growth and imposing social control. Right? I mean, so the the workers' self-organization is completely forbidden, as we know by the recent uh, development in Guang, in Shenzhen, uh, which is a very important condition that, uh, actually in a way, force migrants to become suspended, right? Because it's, it, they're just not allowed to really engage with the reality, uh, with, with uh, their present condition in a serious way to organize them to change. Uh, but this is known. This is known. So therefore, we don't uh, pay too much. Uh, we don't spend too much time on that dimension. Uh, we want to say that you know, it's a, the suspension condition is not entirely determined by the formal structure of policies. There's something else there. Uh, so that is uh, the, the, the very uh, uh, repressive regime. But at the same time, we must uh, realize that the. It is equally, it is an equally important priority for the government to deliver growth, right? So the repression of labor in China so far have not really led to quite a violent reaction, partly or probably mainly because the state has managed to satisfy the population's desire for a better material life. Uh, so what is interesting uh, in the domain of governance is that the state, particularly at the local level, they kind of move between these two priorities. One day they emphasize growth, and the next day they emphasize control. So we have uh, in, you know, ethnographic studies to show in, in, in the local communities. So one day they say, OK, the development is more important, so therefore all the migrants came. And then the local residents were allowed to extend their houses to accommodate the migrants for rent. Huh? Then the next day they say, okay, you know, social order, so all the houses are, you don't have permission, so therefore have to be knocked down and the migrants are chased away. And the day after tomorrow, again, you know, it's about glows. And then all the, 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 land, the, the local residents will rush to build their house as quickly as possible once uh, there is a possibility emerged because they wanted to maximize these small windows uh, to, to get a rent before the next round of demolition uh, comes in. So therefore in this process, actually everyone is put in a state, state of suspension, including the local cadres, uh, local cadres at the level of Jiedao, the street level and the Xiang township level, they were also suspended in the sense that they are very busy. Every day they are in rush, either you know, constructing new buildings or demolishing the buildings that they constructed yesterday, but they can never really have a clear long-term plan. But everyone tries to maximize whatever opportunity that they can grab now. Uh, so this is the kind of this, uh, this, this the, uh, uh, oscillation or, or you know, the movement, the shift between two priorities create a particular dynamics that, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, leads to the condition of suspension. And the social welfare, I mean, the third domain uh, is, is uh, uh, social welfare provision. We must say the Chinese government has done very impressive work in this regard. 
95 percent, more than 95 percent of Chinese population are now covered by medical care, as a certain medical care. Uh, so the pension provision is uh, is increasing, and also the you know the min the default minimum livelihood uh, subsistence. Uh, 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 I can't remember, insurance scheme. They're doing quite well. But of course, I mean, it is a, a, a very uh, widespread, but a very, very thin in, you know, in sense of the amount of money that they uh, is uh, providing. So therefore, the, this also creates a kind of a, a peculiar condition that the social welfare is not really providing a strong safety net that settles uh, the population into secured, a lifestyle. Is that too far or too close? To I think we yeah, get a little further. Okay, a bit of fun. Yeah. Uh, rather than providing a strong safety net, you know, like a bag that put you inside and uh, make you settled, actually this social welfare provision is seems more if more effective in enabling many citizens to join the game of competition for wealth accumulation. Hmm? Because if they don't have this safety, uh, this uh, welfare provisions, many people probably were not able to take the risk, migrate to the cities, let alone to be so mobile. You know, so the, the, because hypermobility needs a certain capacity. Eh? It's not everyone can be hypermobile. Hmm? So, uh, and of course, I mean, this is relate, related to this, we must recognize that the socialist legacy. Uh, is also very important in the sense of suspension. The Chinese reform, in a way, actually is a state-led mass movement. It was participated by the majority, the vast majority of the population who had more or less equal asset in the beginning. But ironically enough, this relatively egalitarian starting point of the reform induced a strong sense of competition eh? because it is such a massive scale. And everyone started with quite an equal starting point, but everyone wanted to get ahead of other people. right? So it's a mass uh, 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 competition. So that is uh, here the irony. Uh, and then you have the, the fourth domain is I call the social norm. Social norm, you know, later we will talk about people on one hand become very entrepreneurial in daily activities, grab all the opportunities, but at the same time, they also become very conformist in, this, uh, uh, in terms of a long, a long time life planning as well as uh, issues like you know whom you should marry, what kind of family you should have. In a way, they become quite conservative uh, in, in, at that kind of ideological level. So it's very entrepreneurial on one hand, on daily activity, very instrumentalist, but at the same time quite conformist in fundamental value questions. So this uh, and all these kind of entanglements. So entangled the development, of course, is I mean. So therefore, uh, remind us. Uh, the, how different the suspension is from exclusion, from just a simple marginalization in the form that we are familiar with, as well as how it is different from so-called precarious labor. Hmm? We can come back to this later. But the precarious labor, of course, these suspended people are very precarious. Uh, they don't have you know, a job security, and etc. So empirically, at a descriptive level, they are very similar to the precarious labor in the global north. But we have to appreciate the historical trajectories, the different historical trajectories which have led to the precarious labor in the global north and the, 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 the journey that the suspended population have taken in China. The precarious in the global north are the people who are deprived of job security and the welfare, which they had had before. Hmm? As a result of the withdrawal of welfare state, as a result of deindustrialization, as a result of the rise of a post the production regime, etc. But the rise of a suspension in China is almost the opposite. opposite. I mean, if you look at the welfare, the welfare is increasing rather than decreasing. 
if you look at the economy, the manufacturing economy, it's growing rather than, de well, rather than declining, right? So therefore, the political economy meaning of precarity and the suspension, I think it's very different. I mean, this is what we, you know, what, what I meant earlier when I said the established concept somehow cannot capture the, what's going on, the dynamics, the meaning of what we see in China and in, in, in Asia. I mean, the danger is always like that. You know, every our neoliberalism and uh, precarious China and etc. cetera. I, mean, I, I think in Asia probably, I think probably Japan is uh, the only country I feel that the precarious a precarity can be used quite accurately to describe the, the, the recent change. Even like Hong Kong, Singapore, you know, it's a, it's it's a, uh, 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 I mean, as I said, you know, they are descriptively precarious, but uh, but analytically, you it will be very misleading if we use uh, the same uh, word to analyze them as the word that we use to, for the people in Europe, young workers in Europe. But therefore, we this explain their political actions, their political actions, why the precarious, you know, the, 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 the precarious labor in Europe actually now becoming a major political force, right? The Occupy movement and et cetera. But in Asia, the so-called precarious are no, by, I mean, it's nowhere close to being a, it's an important political uh, force, right? Now, why is this some, why the people here are angry and the white people there are not angry and such? How much more time do I have? Five minutes, okay. Uh, so, ten minutes. Huh? Ten minutes. Uh, ten, minutes. Ten, ten minutes, I'm sorry. Thanks for the generosity of our chat. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, then three, um, the third sub-theme is that some specific dynamics of, of uh, the condition of suspension, number one is time-space fragmentation, how time and space come in, you know, in uh, small pieces and uh, then uh, set apart by unexpected rupture between. Uh, as I, you know, the example in the community, migrant community, you know, demolition and construction, you don't know what's going on. I mean, you always have a place to live, but you don't know when your roof will be gone. Uh, so we have other examples. Uh, for that as well. And the second uh, um, theme is uh, what I would call this uh, entrepreneurial with means, but the conformist with ends, right? The highly instrumental, instrumentalist in accumulating wealth uh, in daily life, but then you ask, why do you do that? Then we found quite interesting, everyone's talking about family value. You know, family, I'm doing this for my family, so this kind of uh, new feminism, uh, new feminism, uh, you, it's related to all this deep anxiety of Sheng Nu, surplus mm. woman, Zhong mm. Guoshi Bi Hun, you know, forced mm. marriage in China style. Because why now? I mean, when I was young, when I was at your age or slightly younger, unthinkable. I mean, they, they, I mean, they, they, I mean if, especially if you go to college, I mean, you know, they, uh, we can't think of any parents will be worried about your marriage and looking for uh, uh, the partners for you, go to Renmin Guangchang, you know, put the advertisement <laughs> out. I mean, that will be the ultimate humiliation of our youth dignity. Uh, but now this has become a common thing in, in, in urban China. Uh, so, so that kind of, uh, I mean, there is a more kind of nuanced dynamics going on. Once this kind of ideology is the ultimate norm become essentialized. This means it moves away from everyday life, eh? from everyday life. So you feel that you have to inst instrumentalize your everyday life in order to achieve this, this, this uh, normative goal, which is uh, far away. But this normative goal cannot give you any moral guidance about what you should live your life today, how you should accumulate your wealth. So therefore, there is a gap between on one hand, the instrumentalist every day, and on the other hand, the ultimate normative future. Hmm? So this actually is another reason of suspension. Suspension. So this, uh, uh, yeah, I didn't mention, but actually I was quite inspired by Jane Gaia, the anthropologist, uh, discussion about uh, the, he, she calls the evacu uh, evacuation of the near future, the near future. Huh? 
she's talking about, you know, the, uh, after the 1970s, there is in the public representation, uh, the, the temporal imagination is increasingly dominated by a combination of the immediate, now and here, and the very long term, very long term. And it's quite interesting. She she goes back to to Hayek and and uh, Friedman, you know, Milton Friedman, and this monetarism economic is basically talking about the long term. They say you you just do your best uh, as an individual, as a rational individual now, and then the market will work itself out in the very long term. What about between? We don't know. Uh, we don't know. I, uh, Hayek said, if you think of this b between in the short, I mean, in the near future, actually that is a very dangerous thing to do. Dangerous thing to do because that is uh, the the time horizon that all kinds of ideologies, all kind of desires for change will come in. Mm. So anyway, so that's I mean, in the China, I mean, this China condition is slightly different, but this kind of the middle, the medium range, the displacement of the near future as well as the nearby. I call it nearby. Nearby is a meaning stable social relations between you and your surroundings. For example, for migrants workers, is the social relations between you and your colleagues and the relation between you and your factories. These kinds of things are displaced. Huh? So the near future and the nearby are being displaced. This is another meaning of suspension. OK, the final link. What's about future? I mean, people are not happy. Our, I mean, the workshop uh, all agree that people are not happy. So suspended life is not a happy life. <laughs> so what the people are doing, S three strategies, I mean, not st uh, three reactions. One is moving up, which is, I said, is a conventional strategy. You want to accumulate uh, more money, and also now people start taking all kinds of courses, try to become skilled workers. Fine, because the economy is still growing. This is a strat uh, realistic strategy for some people. Number one is a standing still. Standing still, we do observe now there's a tendency of slowdown, including the emergence of a Foxi <laughs> Wenhua, the Buddha-like or Buddhism-like subculture, which I think is interesting to observe. Uh, the Sang Wenhua, Sang Wenhua can have very critical meaning there. Uh, the third uh, 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 reaction actually is a breakdown. You know, just one day you, you can no longer suspend yourself. Why? Because you are dying. You are dying. So one of the papers presented at the workshop was this black lung disease patients. Mm -hmm. uh, then at the end of their life, they, are no, they, they call themselves a rubbish man, a waste man, fagan. But it is only by becoming waste man, fagan, they, they regained their political agency. Because there's no future anymore, so therefore they have to enjoy the, the present as it is. So therefore they organize themselves to demand the state to give them compensation, to demand the justice. So they have nothing to fear, and they have nothing, no longer future to look forward to. So they have to act now, right? So that is what I mean, break it down. Uh, then here, I think that the intellectuals can play a role, you know, by by really teasing out people's reactions and experiences, so therefore to inform the uh, 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 people in different uh, mode of resistance or reactions of each other's strategies and the thinking. So probably, uh, yeah, so the, the, the condition can be changed bottom up. Thank you.